Father, we would pray, Father, that your spirit be with us. Speak to me and through me, Father. May my words uplift you and you only, please. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to start with a few questions this morning. I'm going to ask that with a few... Uh, you're actually not in church, but let me ask you this question. If you were here, <laughs> why did you come to church today? What is your motive? Another one. Why do you go to church full stop? What's your point? Another one. Why do you go on Saturday? And another one. Why did people not come to church today? If people didn't come to church because you're at church, you've got a job to do. And I, before you go home for lunch or before you have lunch, go and see them, make things right. But there's lots of questions today. We have young people asking questions. And depending what study you look at, between 62 and 80% of our young people leaving church, that means we're keeping about 3 out of 10 people, young people, which is not good. And uh, I believe Blair spoke about this book a little while ago. Guys, I'd recommend you buy one for all your board leaders, board members, read it, and then implement this into your church, and then pass the book around and get it out as much as possible. It's a good book. Okay. But I want to ask some more questions. Questions that not just young people, but people that are new, struggling, not sure where they fit, asking these are questions. For example, they're asking, where do I fit into God's church? Or they might ask, does this, this church, does God's church even look like it's worth fitting into? Because sometimes they say, why would I bother? Other times, is it acting like God's church? Is God's church acting like God's church? Is even God's church, there's plenty of other churches down the road with more action happening than, in, than, than the church I go to? Is, the church, is church in general even relevant in 2021? And a question I think we should all ask ourselves, what do people out there see that we have that they want? Because if we can't answer that question, then why do we exist? And what's our purpose? There has to be a purpose in life. We're going to go this morning to the books of Daniel and Revelation, particularly Revelation, but don't worry just yet because I'm, I'm speaking to a huge, broad subject. And... Um, I'm going to give you a lot of background building up to it to show you, the, show you where this fits in. But in particular, we're going to Revelation chapter 10. But uh, I'm going to give you a bit of background before we get there. So let's start with this quote here. I like this quote. It says, When we as a people understand what this book, and it's talking about the book of Revelation, we, when we as a people understand what the book of Revelation means to us as a people, there will be seen among us a great revival. And I think that we all need a revival in our personal lives, in our churches. And it goes on to say we don't understand fully the lessons that it teaches. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of prophecies. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is right the way through it. We don't fully understand the lessons that teaches, notwithstanding the injunctions given us to search and study it. But I know that as we do for my personal life, it brings revival in my life. As we study Bible prophecy, as we study Daniel, Revelation, Bible prophecy, we find out where we've come from, we find out where we're going, and we also find out why we are here. And if we look at that, if we find those things, three things, we find identity, we find purpose, and we find belonging. Where we come from, where we're going to, and why we are here, identity, purpose and belonging and that's where we're going this morning and we're going to do it from Revelation chapter 10 but before we go there let's get some bigger picture about Revelation and where chapter 10 is coming from. I want to take you to some basics in Revelation. There's seven churches, seven seals and seven trumpets. In the seven churches Jesus comes in the seventh church which is the Laodicean church and uh, that's the time period that we're living in right now. In the seven seals, Jesus comes in seal number six, and seal number seven is part of the second coming. But seal number six, has, it finishes with the, the wicked crying for the rocks and mountains to fall on them, and it asks the question, who will be able to stand in this time? 
And it gives a whole chapter, chapter 7, answering that question, who can stand in the second coming and be ready for Jesus to come? When you come to the seven trumpets, it does something similar. It goes one, two, three, four, five, six trumpets. Jesus comes in trumpet number seven. But when it comes to trumpet number six, it gives two chapters, or one and three quarter, all of chapter 10 and most of chapter 11, telling you the circumstances, the time frame, where we're at when we come to the time we're living in right now. So that we know very clearly that Revelation chapter 10 that we are speaking about today is part of this time period. We're, we're living in the time period of that time. <laughs> the, um, there's a 1260-year prophecy. That sounded like Russell Court, I think. The, um, the, anyhow, we're living in... <laughs> get back to the subject. 1260 years. The 1260 years is, part of the, is, is another prophecy in Daniel Revelation. And the 1260-year period goes from 538 to 1798. And the end of the 1260 years is called the beginning of the... It's called the time of the end. It's not the end of time. End of time is when Jesus comes. But the time of the end starts after 1798. And Revelation chapter 10 comes after this time period. It fits in straight after that time period, in the time of the end. We'll find this as we go through a bit more. And then... In Daniel, we have a 2,300-year prophecy going from 457 BC, from the going forth to restore Jerusalem, to 1844. And this morning, we're going to tie 2,300 days into Revelation chapter 10 and all the events that happen around. And um, hopefully, this is all a background picture that will show you where we're going. Another one. I want to show you something else before we get there. The chiastic structure of Revelation. And now a chiasm, in case you're not quite familiar, in, a, in a, a passage of Scripture, not all Scripture, but passages of Scripture are written in a chiasm, where the first part and the last part says a similar thing. The second and the second last part say a similar thing. Until you come to the center of the chiasm, and that is the focal point of that bit of Scripture. All of Revelation is written as a chiasm. Let me show you. Uh, in the beginning and the end, you have a prologue and epilogue. At the second part, you have promises to the overcomer, and then you have fulfillment of the promises to the overcomer. Coming into C, we have God's work for humanity's salvation, and then C, God's work for humanity's salvation is completed. E, the commissioning of John the prophecy, and then E, the church proclaims the end time uh, gospel. And then the centre of Revelation, the central focus of Revelation, is the great controversy between Christ and Satan. That's the great controversy. That's what Revelation is all about. Now, if we show this another way, we can do it like this. Revelation 1 to 11 builds up to 1844. Then you've got chapter 12, God's church in the final conflict. Revelation 13, the Antichrist church in the final conflict. And then verses, uh, chapters 14 to 22, which is God's final victory. And you'll notice again, in the centre of Revelation is the great controversy, but this time it's very clear. It's being played out on the earth between God's people, the people who follow Jesus, and another power that doesn't follow Jesus. And so the focus of Revelation is the central theme is about the great controversy, and we're going to pick up on God's church in the final conflict. That's where we're going this morning in our talk. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but I've been saying something over and over, and I need to explain it. I've been saying God's church, God's church, God's church. And I don't know you guys, you don't know me. We, we, I don't know your background, whether you've been long-term Seventh-day Adventist, or you just come, or you don't even... Never even heard of us before. So I just need to explain something here. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist pastor because I believe that the Seventh-day Adventist church follows as closely to the Bible that I know. Let me explain. And uh, here's a text. There's, there's many ways we could do this, but this one text, will give it in a nutshell. It says, In the dragon, that is Satan, was angry with the woman, the woman is the church, and went to make war. 
with the last part, the remnant of her seed, that is, went to make war with the church in the last days, God's church in the last days, the part the church Satan doesn't like. And then it says, they keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Now, the commandments of God is easy. Ten commandments, and there's others, but including the seventh-day Sabbath. The testimony of Jesus, we would then normally flick over to Revelation 19.10, which says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, and that's very true. I agree with it 100%. But we often forget that Revelation chapter 1, verse 2 says that the words of Jesus is the testimony of Jesus. And having an understanding of the words of Jesus in the context of the prophetic message he gives is what this church is about. And so we have a church that keeps the commandments, has a prophetic message, and has an understanding of the prophetic messages given in Daniel and Revelation. And so that is why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Now, let me make something very, very clear at this point. That does not make this church or any of us any better than any other single Christian out there around us. We are no way any better. Let me make that very clear. We have salvation. They can have salvation. If we, if we have a relationship with Jesus, just because we sit in any church doesn't give us a right to heaven. But does it make us more responsible for the message we have? And that is where we're different. We are more responsible for the message we have because of our understanding of the prophetic message which God wants us to share around with other people. So let's go a bit further in background before we get to Revelation chapter 10. In Daniel, as I mentioned before, there's a 2,300-year prophecy. And that's found in Daniel 8.14 under 2,300 days or years when we study it. Um, then the sanctuary would be cleansed, and it went from 457 down to um, 1844. In Revelation, now get this, in Revelation, in, in Revelation 14, you have a three angels message. The three angels message was to be preached just before 1844 through to the end of time. And in Revelation chapter 10 is a prophetic message about the people who preached Revelation 14 before and after 1844. Is that clear? So in other words, folks, let me say this again. Revelation, uh, sorry, Daniel 8.14, 2,300 days, finishing in 1844. Revelation 14, three angels' messages that is to be preached prior to 1844 and, and right through the second coming. And Revelation 10, where we're going, is about the people who preached the message in 1844 and continue to do so. That's where we're going today, to Revelation chapter 10. To do so, before we do so, I should say, I'm going to ask you a few more questions. For example, where does the Seventh Adventist Church stand in all this? Are we just another church or are we different? Does God have a purpose for the Seventh Adventist Church? If so, what is it? Or are we just no different than any other church? Is the Seventh Adventist Church fulfilling the purpose God has for us? We'll find that as we go and look at Revelation chapter 10 in conjunction with all this. Now, guys, I'm giving you the big picture here. I'm giving you a big picture. I've talked about seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, 1260 years, 2300, Revelation chapter 10. If you don't know what we're talking about, and this is all gobbledygush to you guys, then what I want you to do is go and grab your minister and pester him to give you some Bible studies. Or even better, even better, grab a group of church friends and go and sit down and study Revelation and Daniel to yourselves. As a church group, as a little family group, as a worship group, as a small group, whatever group. Study it for yourselves. Grab the old prophecy seminar. The graphics are hopeless, they're old, they're out of date, but the words in it are fantastic. They are very complete. Very good. And uh, I encourage you to get in a small group and restudy if you haven't done that for a while. Restudy these subjects. Okay. Let's hone in now on 1844. I want to go to a bloke by the name of William Miller. William Miller was a deist. That means he believed God had created the world and buzzed off and left it to the mess it's in now. Until one day when all the men around him were killed in a battle and he was left alive, he started to wonder whether God did really care. 
And so as he started the study, he went through book by book in the Bible, starting in Genesis. He came to Daniel and he found Daniel 8.14. And as he studied Daniel 8.14, looked at prophecy, history, calendars, etc., he came to the conclusion Jesus would come, in, or the prophecy would finish, and he thought Jesus would come in 1843. To cut a long story short, later it was changed to 1844. We're just going to talk 1844 today. He wasn't the only person preaching this message. If you go to South America, there was a Jesuit priest called Lacanza. He preached under a, uh, a, a false, false name, under a, a, the name of a Jewish rabbi. And he wrote a book called, translated into English, The Coming of the Messiah and Majesty and Glory. That book made its way to England, where about 800 Anglican church clergy were preaching from this book. They were all preaching that Jesus would come in the mid-1840s. Not the only one preaching it again. There was a bloke by the name of um, 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 Joseph Wolfe. Joseph Wolfe preached throughout the Middle East and in the um, American um, Parliament that Jesus was coming soon. They were all looking at this same prophecy, coming to a same conclusion. There was a mistake. Um, if you want to look this up, by the way, if you, if you Google Great Awakening, you'll find that the Great Awakening was pre in the early 1700s. There was a religious revival. That died off. And then if you Google Second Great Awakening, you'll find there was a Second Great Awakening that happened late 1700s, early 1800s. And William Miller was part of this Second Great Awakening. And as Adventists, we call his segment of it probably the Millerite Movement. Um, is what, be, but he was part of a bigger movement, a worldwide revival around the world. So, coming back to William Miller, he found the 2,300 days. He found 1844, 1843, then 1844. He found where the sanctuary was to be cleansed, and common to the day, he believed that the earth was the sanctuary. And if the earth was to be cleansed, how could it be cleansed? Unless it was by um, purifying by fire at Jesus' second coming, which the Bible talks about. So they preached the cleansing of the sanctuary was the second coming and that Jesus would come in 1844. They preached this first and second angel's message and they actually came to a date, October 22, 1844. And what happened on that date? A huge, huge bit of disappointment. These people, let me, uh, we will never grasp, I don't believe, we'll never grasp the concept of how bitter the disappointment was to these people. But let me try and do this for you. The date today is October 2. If you really, really believed that Jesus was coming on October 22, 20 days' time, just 20 days' time, would your life be different today than it was yesterday? I think we would all probably say yes. And that's probably unfortunate because it shouldn't be, but it would be. And that's, that's probably good anyhow that we realise the earnestness of the time. And these people really, really believe Jesus was coming October 22, 1844. They believed it so much they sold their houses and gave money to, be, to, to share the work. They didn't plough up their fields. They didn't plant. They didn't harvest. They, they just left their jobs. They went out and preached, Jesus is coming. Be ready. We've got nothing to lose Go for it. They were so keen. And then October 22, 1844, when the dong struck 12 at midnight, the disappointment was amazing. And remember, there's no dole. There's no social security. Some of these people were destitute. But that's not the disappointment. The disappointment was that they were so, so longing for Jesus to come. They were so expecting him to be here. And he wasn't. And they had to go back to the world. They had to go back and live again, normal. And, and they were so discouraged. One of the men, Hiram Edson, had spent the night with a group of friends in his barn. Jesus didn't come. They'd been praying. He and the guy Crozier decided that they would um, walk across the paddock and go with some friends. And they... As they did so, um, Hiram Edson, we don't know if it was a dream, impression or whatever it was, but he stopped. And he started to think, what if, it, 
what if the earth isn't the sanctuary? What if it's a heavenly sanctuary? What if it's a different sanctuary that is to be cleansed? And that's where we went wrong. This group of people that following Miller, by the way, I should tell you, depending where you read, group numbered from about 60 to 100 and something thousand. A lot of people following this message of Miller. When this bitter disappointment came, they basically grew, broke up into four groups. The larger proportion disappeared back into society. Another group believed Jesus did come and that everyone was now holy with some very unholy results. A third group kept on date setting and you can go to a church down the road here that broke away from that group that kept on date setting. And then the fourth group, which numbered only about 100 people, got together and said, where did we go wrong? They went back to, the, to, the, to their timing. No, 1844, October 22 is correct. We have not made a mistake. They went back to their studying of what is the sanctuary. Excuse me. And along with Hiram Edson, his input, this group of about 100 people got together. And in doing so, they found Revelation chapter 10. Let's go to Revelation chapter 10 and have a read of what it says. We're going to read all of the chapter. It's not a big chapter, but we're going to just home in on some certain parts of text or text. As I said, we're giving a big overview today. It's a real push through this real quick. But let me read Revelation chapter 10 to you. I see it says, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud and a rainbow about his head. His face was like the sun, his feet like pillars of fire. If we were to stop there, we would find that this is talking about Jesus. If we compared scripture with scripture, we'd find this is talking about Jesus. Why is he called an angel? Because angel simply means messenger. But this is not an ordinary angel. This is a mighty angel. He has a mighty message to give. And he comes down and the description describes Jesus. Verse 2. He had in his hand a little book open. I want to stop there for a minute. If you are using a New Living Translation right now, your translation will say he had in his hand a scroll having been opened. And it gives the, the thought that this scroll has just been opened up. And that's exactly what's been happening. Remember, these people have been studying Daniel chapter um, 8, 1844. And at the end of the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, it says this in verse 4, But you, Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book, and the words close this book up, and then it says when it was to be opened, even to the time of the end. When is the time of the end? After the 1260-year period finishes, after 1260 years, 1798, the book of Daniel was to be opened up. Many will run to and fro and knowledge will be increased. Knowledge in the book of Daniel will be increased after 1798. And he repeats it again in Daniel chapter 12 verse 9. He said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And these people, as they read in the, in the book of um, Revelation here in chapter 10, they said, huh, that's interesting. We've been studying a book that's also been closed. And it's been opened at the right time. Let's keep reading. Verse 4, it talks about seven thunders that uttered their voices. John was about to write when he heard the se a voice from heaven saying, Seal up the things which the seven thunders said. Don't write them down. Very clearly he understood them, but he was told not to write. The angel which I saw standing upon the sea and upon the earth, that is a worldwide message by the way, it's sea and land. Swear by him that lives forever and ever who created the heavens. Let me read this bit slower. Swear by him that lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that are therein, and the sea and the things that are therein. That, folks, is a very close tie to Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, the first angel's message, where it says, Fear God, give glory to him, the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made the heaven and the earth and the foundation of the waters and the things that are therein, depending what version you're using. It's a very close link to the message they've been preaching. And then we read on further. Um, where am I? I'm in verse 5. Uh, he's standing on the sea. No, verse 6. He swear by him that lives forever and ever, created the heavens and the sea and the fountain and the earth, um, that there should be time no longer. Now this is interesting. As these people read this chapter, they said, here's a third link. 
It's a book that's been sealed and now opened at the right time. It's a book that is talking about and linking itself to the three angels' messages, the first angel in particular. It's a book that says time no longer, and they'd been studying the 2,300-year prophecy of which there was no prophetic time after that. This was the la- There's more prophets, more prophecies after that, but there's no more prophetic time after 2,300-year prophecy finishes, 1844, time no longer. These guys are starting to wake up and saying, hey, is this talking about the book of Daniel that we have been studying? Let's keep reading. Um, verse 7. Then in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, that is the seventh angel of the trumpets, he will begin to sound and the mystery of God should be finished. The mystery of God, folks, is you want to put it in the simplest form? Why would God want to save a bunch of rotters like us? That is a mystery. If you want to know what the mystery of God is, that's the bottom line. You can study that further. Um, that the mystery of God should be finished as he has declared to his servants the prophets. Okay. Verse 8. And the voice I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go and take this little book that's in the angel's hand, that's standing upon, upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went to the angel and said, Give me the little book. He said to me, Take it. Eat it up, it will make your belly bitter, but it will be sweet as in your mouth sweet as honey. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it up. It was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I'd eaten it, my, be- my belly was bitter. By the way, that's another chiasm just there. The, um, that's another subject. The, um, these folk had just been through an experience of studying the book of Daniel. A book that had been closed and just opened at the right time after 1798. It had been, they'd been preaching the, second, the first and second angels' message. There was, time, there was prophetic time no longer. And they had gone through a sweet, extra sweet, and then very bitter disappointment. And what they had missed was something in the book of Daniel... When you read Daniel chapter 12, verse 9, which is on the screen there, he said, Go your way, Daniel... For the words are closed up and sealed even till the time of the end. The next verse says, Many will be purified and made white. That is, many will, it'll be a sweet experience. The gospel will be preached. Gee, people will accept Jesus. It'll be a great, sweet experience. And the next two words says, And tried. After the preaching of this message in 1844, there would be a testing, a trying time, a testing time. It says, the wicked will do wickedly and no one understand it, but the wise will work it out. The wise will work it out. And that's exactly what we find was happening with these people. They were working it out. We haven't read verse 11 yet or, 11, or chapter 11, 1 and 2. Let's go and read chapter 10. Um, or I should, maybe I should just stop there a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself. When they read Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 to 10, in, that, in those days, 1844, there was only about 100 people. Five years later, there was two and a half thousand people following this message. That growth is phenomenal when you think of growth of a church. Why the growth and what had happened? They had found identity. God had saw them. God had saw this group of people. He had written about them. He saw their experience. He saw what they would study. He saw the subject they would study. He saw the sweet experience they would have. He saw the disappointment they would have. He wrote about it in Revelation chapter 10. He put it there. And these people found identity. God knows about us. We belong. We are part. We're not just a mistake. We belong in the process of history. We've got a place. We've got identity. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 11 to find purpose. Revelation 10 and 11. Revelation chapter 10, verse 11 and 11, 1 and 2. Let's not stop. These people read on. He said to me, you must prophesy again. Now what have they been doing? They've been preaching. They've been studying prophecy. But they had been prophesying that Jesus would come soon. And the angel says, when you get your act together, when you work out your mistake, I want you to prophesy again and this time do it before many peoples and nations, tongues and kings. First angel's message again. The gospel to the world before nations, kings, tongues and people. A link again to the first angel's message. 
And it doesn't stop there. Maybe I should put this in, but they found purpose. They now had identity, but they weren't just a mistake. They were to carry on and they, they were given a purpose to exist on this earth. This little group of people, and now two and a half thousand people, back five years later, by the time you get into um, 1850, had a purpose. They were to preach and prophesy again. And in Revelation chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, that God even tells them where they make the mistake. 1 and 2 really belong to chapter 10. Remember, the, the chapters were divided up by man. In verse, chapter 11, verse 1, the angel gives John a measuring rod and he says to him, Rise, go to the temple of God, not the earth, the temple of God, and the altar, and those that worship, and measure those that worship therein. Leave out the outer courtyard. And so these people, as they studied, where did they go wrong? They went back to the earthly sanctuary. They went back to the temple. They went back to the services held there. They found the seven yearly feasts. They found the Day of Atonement, which linked right up to 1844, hand in the glove. And they found exactly where they'd gone wrong. They got their act together. They got their message right. And they preached again that Jesus is coming. If we were to ask ourselves some questions again, where does the Seventh-day Adventist church stand in all this today? That little group of people, a few years later, took on the name Seventh-day Adventist. There are only two churches that I know of in the Bible that are identified. They're not, the names aren't given, but they're identified very clearly. As you read Daniel and Revelation, you have the Antichrist power, an Antichrist church. It's clearly identified. We could name it. But in Revelation chapter 10, you have the other church that is identified. That is identified in the Bible, the Seventh-day Adventist church. This is the rise of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And remember, the controversy on earth is between God's people on earth and the Antichrist. People, people that don't realise they're following, hopefully they don't realise they're following Satan on earth. The great controversy being, being played out on earth. And so this church, <laughs> where do we stand? Let, let's ask some more questions. We are that church. Is the church relevant for today? Folks, it is absolutely relevant if we are fulfilling God's purpose that he asks us to do, and that is preach the gospel of Jesus. Revelation chapter um, 14, verses 6 to 12, the first angel's message is the gospel in conjunction with prophecy, saying Jesus is coming, be ready. The nation, the, and, and the message has got to go to the world. His forest is beach taking that message to everyone around us. If we're relevant, if we're going to be relevant, that's our job. Does God have a purpose for the SDA church? Worldwide, God has a purpose to every nation, kindred, tongue and people. Are we just another church or are we different? We're not just another church. Are we better? No. Remember what I said before, we are no better than any other Christian. They can have salvation if they have Jesus Christ as their personal saviour. But are we different? Absolutely, because we have been foretold in Revelation chapter 10, we've been given a prophetic message to preach that Jesus is coming, we know what's coming, people are worried and so on, they're moving out of the cities right now because they don't know what's going on, they see it's better in the country. We've been given that message for hundreds of years, hundred years, and, and folks, we know what's about to come. We have the message. We need to preach it. Let me keep going. Is the church fulfilling God's purpose for it? May our folks make it preach. Make Forest's Beach the church that preaches the message of Jesus. And if you do, we have identity. We know Jesus has identified and called us. He's given us a purpose. He want, he's given us a job to do. We have a clear direction. And as we do so, as we find identity and we fulfill purpose, we have belonging. And our young people, I want you to listen to me, guys. If you want to find identity and purpose and belonging in this world, you're only going to find it in Jesus. And as we cling to the message Jesus gives us, and the prophetic message Jesus gives us, 
Salvation is important. Salvation is the most important. Let me get this right. I'm being recorded here. Salvation through Jesus is important. But folks, it doesn't stop there. We need to grow. We need to learn. We need to learn what else did Jesus say. And revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Has our church been faithful to its calling? There's a more important question. Have you and I been faithful to our calling? I want to finish off by going over to Jeremiah chapter 1. I want you to turn on your Bibles. This is not going to be on the screen. So turn on your Bibles if you've got them there. I hope you have. To Jeremiah chapter 1. And we're going to finish off our talk this morning with a very strong parallel in Jeremiah chapter 1 verses 4 to 10. And here we can make a number of parallels. Let me start reading Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4. I hope you've all got it. Just looking around, Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 to 10. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Just stop there a minute. Do we believe that Jesus can see the end from the beginning? Absolutely. Jesus says, Jeremiah, before you were born, I saw you. Do we believe that Jesus foresaw the seventh Adventist church before it was formed? Absolutely. And he wrote about it here in Revelation chapter 10. But more than that, folks, he foresaw every one of us before we were born. And he, he, he has us in mind. Let's keep reading. Um, verse 5. Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. Before you came out of the womb, I sanctified you. What does the word sanctify mean? It means to set aside for a holy purpose. God says, Jeremiah, I set you aside for a holy purpose, set you aside for that before you were born. I believe God sets every one of us aside for a holy purpose, whether we're called a ministry full time or ministry in our daily work, whatever that work might be. God has called us to full time ministry in our, in our sphere. And He has set us aside for that purpose. And God set the Seventh day Adventist church aside, not to be better than any other church, but for a specific purpose, to preach the gospel of Christ in the context of Bible prophecy and that Jesus is coming. And he doesn't finish there in verse 5. He finishes by saying, And I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Hot topic. Let me put you very simply, my, my simple understanding of ordination is when the community, the, the, the community of the church recognizes the gift of God to a person and commissions them to service. That's how I understand the gospel, the, the ordination. God says to every one of us, I have given you talents and I have commissioned you, I've ordained you, I'm sending you as a prophet to the nations. Now let me ask a question here. How many prophets? Anybody put the anybody want to put the hand up? As usual, nobody. Let me ask that question a different way. How many of us here have a prophetic message to share? Every single one of us are called as prophets to the nations to preach a prophetic message of Jesus in the last days, where we're living right now. And the Seventh day Adventist Church has been given that message also as a whole. But it only works if we as individuals are doing it. Verse 5. Then Jeremiah has his whinge. He says, God, I can't do it. I can't speak. I'm only a child. I'm too young. I've only been baptised six months. I've only been baptised six years. I've only been in the church 60 years and I've still done nothing. <laughs> it doesn't work that way, folks. God calls us. And don't be, we're going to read in a minute, but don't be afraid of their faces. We are afraid. Let me read it. I think we're afraid sometimes. Um, verse 7 God said to me, Say not, I'm a, don't say you're too young. You'll go to wherever I send you, whatever I command you, you'll speak. Don't be afraid of their faces. Think about this. Monday morning, you go to work, you go to school, you have your first break, smoker, whatever you want to call it, and what's the, you sit down, what's the first question they're going to ask you? What did you do on the weekend? Always. And I used to start with Saturday night and leave out the holy bit and leave, start with Saturday night and start talking about Saturday night and Sunday, rah, rah, rah. 
until one day I said, blow it, I'm going to be intentionally Christian. I, I claim to be a Christian. I want to be intentional about who I am. So when they asked me, what did you do on, on the weekend? I said, I went to church Saturday morning. Oh, the preacher was boring. Rah, 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 rah. And then I did this and I did that. You know what they asked me next weekend, next Monday? Hey, was your preacher boring again? No, the preacher was great this weekend. He had a message and I'd tell him very briefly and then move on. It opened doors up. I, I learned, and guys, I still contend to be afraid of people's faces. I think we all, that's our fear. But God says, don't be afraid of their faces. He says, don't be afraid because I'm going to give you the words to speak. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. Verse 8, the Lord touched his, uh, put forth his hand to touch my mouth. See this, uh, and he said, I'll put my words in your mouth. I don't know if you've ever experienced this when you're trying to share and there's something, God speaks to your mind and you speak it out as you're learning it, you speak it. it God does it. I've experienced it a few times when I've been in trouble trying to explain something. God works. We don't need to be afraid of their faces. We just need to be faithful. Verse, nine, uh, verse 10 he says to Jeremiah, See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms, just like Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, over the gospel to go to every nation, kingdom, tongue, and people. And he says, To do this, you've got to root out the pull down, to destroy, and to throw down. What does God want us to root out, pull down, destroy, and throw down? Guys, we can't do anything. Let me just say this from the very beginning we are of ourselves useless without the Spirit of God working through us. But with the Spirit of God working through us, we can pull down and put holes in the kingdom of Satan in people's minds and open the way for Jesus. And it doesn't finish there. It says to build and to plant. God wants us to build and to plant the kingdom of Jesus. That is what God's called us to do. So to finish off, let me ask some questions, which we did at the beginning. Where do I fit into God's church? If you don't know where you fit in, you come and... Pastor Neil or Morgan or anybody that's in leadership and you absolutely hammer them until you find out where you fit in. And I'm not talking about taking up the offering. I'm not talking about working the PA, all important jobs. I'm talking about where do I fit in the prophetic message? How do I find my purpose in fulfilling the prophetic message? That's how we've got to find out how we fit in. How do I fit into God's church? in proclaiming the prophetic message. And there's all different ways you can do it. Let me tell you, I'm going to divert. Guys, I'm a little bit over time. I'll tell you a short story. I want to tell you about Alice Ridiart. Alice, when I, my very first church, Alice used to sit on this side of the church. No, it was that side of the church actually. And about the second seat from the end, I was turning around. Now on that side of the church, I'm looking this way. Alice would sit there, couldn't sing a note. We used to walk in with a walker. And not long after I started uh, in the Alice Springs, uh, in uh, Tully there, Alice had, was confined to the nursing home. I used to go and visit Alice in the nursing home. It was after about two years I learnt what Alice was doing. Alice, that couldn't hardly move, was a local. And she would get the local paper, find out every birth, death and marriage, and send a card to them from the Seventh Adventist Church. That was Alice's message. Anybody can do something for Jesus. Let's keep going. Um, does God's church feel like it's worth fitting into? It will. Guys, let me tell you, it will be exciting to be in God's church. It will be exciting to be in the Forest of Beach Church if we're fulfilling God's purpose and you folk are walking in because of the message that, that we're sharing during the week. Is it acting like God's church? It certainly will be if we're sharing the message God gives us. It is, is it even God's church? There are plenty of others. Yes, it is God's church. We are no better than others, as I said before, but we have a message to preach that God has given us that we must preach. We're, no one else is going to preach it. And God has given us a message to preach individually to people that we can connect with like nobody else can connect with because God sends us to them. And our experience, our past, our mistakes is just what they need to hear. Okay, is the church relevant for me today in 221? Absolutely. And all the more as you read this text, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. The very first question I ask, why do we come to church together? It should be, to encourage one another. That's the reason we come to church, to encourage one another. Don't neglect coming to church. As soon as you can, get back in here, encourage one another, especially now that we see the day of his return drawing very near. Absolutely, definitely. So, one last question. I believe God is calling every one of us to be a tool in his hands. 
in the prophetic, in the giving of the prophetic message that he has given this church, church as a purpose to give out and share. Do you want to find identity? Do you want to find belonging? Do you want to find purpose? Identity, purpose, belonging. You can do that as we share the message of Jesus. Would you like to share the message of Jesus with somebody this week? Just in a little word. God bless. Thank you very much. It's Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much. Father, you have called us as a church. You've written the beginnings of our church down in the Bible. We exist. We have a purpose. We have identity. We have a purpose. And Father, we can belong to Jesus because of a personal connection we have with you, Father. We want to thank you for that. We want to thank you for the great message you've given us as a church, the understanding we have as a church, Father. We know where we're going. We don't need to fear as people fear around us and the conspiracies and whatever's going on, Lord, because people are fearful. They don't know what to expect. They don't know where to turn. But we have the answers, Father. We have the answers. I pray, Father, that you'll give us opportunity this week to share a little bit of Jesus with somebody. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.